Hello, welcome to Brain Lab. What we're going to do is cover the basic elements of the buzz. When you walk in the room, if you see this button blue, what you'll do is press it once, and it will begin the startup process for the buzz. So, again, to, just to reiterate, if you push it once, it's going to engage that process, so you may see the, the blue thing. But anyways, you can see that here comes the flashes. I don't know if you're able to zoom in and see that, but the flashes are engaging the startup process. And again, my suggestion would be once you push the button once, just walk away from the system and let it uh, begin the boot up process. So from here, I'll just uh, go into some of the input ports for the buzz while it's beginning the, the startup. We have two USB ports in the front of the system. And then over on the side, we have a CD drive. So up here is the CD drive. So if for some reason PAX is down, we're still able to load up images manually. And then importantly, as we get into some troubleshooting, I'll point out the, the main power switch is over here. So for um, you know, any troubleshooting, this will be one of our go-tos to try to get the system from an unfreeze position. We do have two more USB ports here if you run out of space over here. And again, this would be kind of the manual data loading or if uh, the doctor's bringing in images from his clinic and has it on USB, we can load them up through this port as well, or one of the two. And here's the welcome screen. So as I tell everybody that's gone through the training the last couple of days, you know, don't be afraid to touch the system. There's nothing you can do that's going to affect what's happening in the surgical field. This essentially is a video router. So all the monitors in the room, uh, you'll see down at the bottom here, they're going to populate. So all of these destinations here, can, we can take what's ever up in this above the, the yellow line, and we'll be able to drop down into these different slots in the, as destinations. Now, again, just to break this up, you know, everything up here has the ability to go down to one of the monitors, and, and most importantly is going to be for the team in this room is the sources. Any of the sources are going to be plugged in through the equipment boom behind us. So anytime you plug in a monitor, just be aware that if you don't see it populate, we have a refresh button right here that will let you refresh, and then you should see the, uh, the box pop up with whatever, uh, whatever you added into the uh, sources. And then from the Brain Lab side, the Brain Lab side has a DICOM viewer with uh, PAX integration. And that's where we're going to start here is the first thing we'll want to do is queue up our patient scan. That was just uh, information about the software. I hit the About button. But if I hit Select Patient, it's going to open up the local cache. Now, is, uh, again, this is what we're seeing is there's only three patients loaded up on the local cache. So if you don't see your patient, that just means we haven't pulled, in, pulled it down from PAX yet. Uh, and to pull down from PAX, we're just going to go over to the search box. And you'll see that once we type in the search, a keyboard populates and we're able to type in the patient name. Uh, in addition to patient name, we can also search by the patient's E number. So if you type in the E and then the patient number, you'll be able to uh, execute that PAX query retrieve. And then lastly, I'll just point out we're on the PAX query retrieve subject. This is a one-way street, so we're only pulling images down. We're not able to send back up. The fill-up system will have the ability to send a PAX, so any intraoperative imaging that's acquired will have to be sent from Philips to PAX, and then if you want to view those on the, bu the buzz system to route around the room, what we'll have to do is then go back into PAX and then update the, uh, update the patient study with the new films that have been acquired. So what we're going to do here is I've got three patients. I'm just going to highlight the patient that I want to use today. So again, this would be just like grabbing the patient from PAX. I'm going to select them in orange, and then from here, we're going to press the select button on the lower right. And now, it's going to take us back to our home screen, where we have our patient queued up, and then while we can, uh, to view those images, what we'll do is we'll launch the DICOM viewer. Now, this is just like what it's going to look like when you execute a PAX search. With the PAX search, it's going to open up all the studies that have been uploaded into PAX, and it's going to list them from most recent to oldest. So if there's a specific date that you're looking for for the study, obviously you can use these uh, timestamps to determine which study you want. In addition, any heading, any DICOM header that radiology has added to the system, it will be labeled under the scan. So if it's you know, a, potential, you know, a scout or a, a flare or any, any of the data set, if you're looking for a specific type, it's going to be labeled where it says number one on my study. Again, we're just using uh, uh, training data. So it's kind of limited what, we'll, what you'll see, but 
you know, you'll, when you get your hands on this, you'll be able to uh, see exactly what we're talking about. So what you see what I just did is I selected the data set that I want. Once it's selected, it's now going to queue up over as, um, as we call this, as this is your grocery store. And then once you select it, it's going to jump over into your cart, so to speak. And then from here, I've got the data set that I want to view. I just press OK, and it launches the DICOM viewer. So within the DICOM viewer, again, this is pretty straightforward. If, if it's, a, it's all touch screen function, so there is no keyboard or mouse. So you're going to be using your finger tip, fingertips to drive the system. Uh, in addition, BrainLab does offer a sterile stylet or unsterile stylet. So if you're not comfortable using your fingertips, uh, we have a device that will let you move the system uh, accordingly. Now, to understand how the one touch or the multi-touch function works is whatever's highlighted in blue is going to be the function that's activated. So you can see I'm scrolling through my data set here with the scroll highlighted. To zoom, I just touch zoom. And now that same up and down movement will produce the zoom in and zoom out. And then lastly is the pan. If I want to pan the data set or move it in a different spot on the screen, that's what the pan function does. Uh, I will point out, since it is a multi-touch, uh, the, the single touch is designed for sterile use. So what that would mean is if I want to zoom and I'm sterilely in the field, I can bring up my, my disposable stylet and I'd be able to sterilely use the system. But what we do for the OR team, if they're not scrubbed in, is you can also use your fingertips as a uh, almost kind of an iPad feel where you can use a zoom in and zoom out. In addition, you can see the scroll function is still activated. So that's kind of that multi-touch uh, technology where we unlock the software to give, you know, if you want to use it sterilely or unsterilely, it'll just be one of those things that, uh, you know, each probably on a case-by-case -case basis. The next step in the workflow so those are your just basic data manipulation. Um, I want to point out the viewing option. So if we select viewing, and you'll see that there's a head here. It says add view. The head also exists up here. These two buttons do the same thing. Essentially what they're doing is opening up the different views that are off of the in, uh, interpolated views, as we call them. So I have an axial cut of this uh, training data. And if I'd like to see the coronal and sagittal of these, I can grab both of them. And you'll see that the software will now display, you can see axial, coronal, and sagittal. So if I want that coronal view to expand, I can touch the coronal view and it's highlighted in orange. And then if I hit this arrow, it will open it up and take over and expand in, and that's my primary view box. So from here, it, it, we can easily toggle between the different views by, if we select axial, you'll see it overrides and it takes over the big screen. If I wanted that sagittal view up, same thing. It'll take over, and I still have that same functionality. So this is kind of how the workflow will go in pulling up patient images. Uh, there are a few features that I might as well highlight while I'm here. The, the main one is the windowing. So if radiology sends you an image that is either too bright or too dark, you do have the ability to adjust the sharpness and the contrast. And then, again, if your fingers go crazy and you do something where you're like, uh-oh, I don't know what I did, not to be, uh, we have a reset button, not to be worried as we're able to reset and just take it back to the original radiological settings, and then obviously we can go forward if, you know, you want to perform the task again. Uh, I'll go back to reset, and that's really all that you'll use in the viewing tab. The next one here is measuring. We do have some measuring tools that if you need to measure out different distances, you can see that uh, I can create an, uh, a line and it'll give a measurement of it in addition to a circle where we can adjust the uh, radius diameter to fit any anatomical regions of interest. And then lastly, we do have an angle as well. If you need an angle calculator, we can do that. To get rid of those, if we didn't want them on the data set, it's pretty straightforward. You just touch the garbage can, the delete, and then you just touch what you want deleted and it'll get rid of these. Again, these features probably won't be used too much. They're more of a, you know, they're just built into the software. And again, it'll just be on one of those case-by-case -case basis. So the next step in the workflow is once we have the images up we want to route around the room is we're gonna go to our home button. And I wanna emphasize, it, your tendency will probably wanna hit done. Don't hit done here because if you hit done, it'd be like closing the app. It'd be closing the app and it's saying that you don't want to use the DICOM viewer anymore. So what I'm going to do here is just press the home button, and you can see now I'm back to that startup screen, 
where I have my patient images queued up, and now it just becomes a destination game. If I want this on one of the monitors listed below, I'll just grab it and drag it to where I want it. So you can see, you know, here the image will populate on the, um, the mini screens of these, which again are routed around the room. And I've got my DICOM viewer up on these two screens. And now, again, this is where you'll tie in your sources. If you want your OR live camera feed running on any of these monitors, it's all drag and drop. So it's just a matter of getting comfortable with dragging and dropping these in. And then the other function that's here is going to be our OR clock. So we also have a, a timer built into this. Obviously, it's the, that's displaying time. But over here, if you select this anesthesia button, it's going to go ahead and start a clock. So that anesthesia clock can start. And then in addition, we have a surgical clock. So they're both labeled. So from here, if we want to route that around the room, it's the same thing, where we can have them queued up, we go back to our home button. And then from here, we can grab this drag and we'll drag it right on into the destination, and you'll see that the OR clock will fill to the desired, the desired position. So some troubleshooting, troubleshooting techniques. Uh, a couple things to, to do. If the system freezes, you're gonna be limited on what you'll be able to touch. So our suggestion, you have two options. We can hold down this button right here for 10 seconds, and essentially that's just doing a hard shutdown on the system. So 10 second, hold that down, you'll see the color turn from green to blue. And then again, once it's in that blue position, you push it once and you'll be able to start the activation process. The other option is over here on the field trip. If you go to the side of the buzz, that's where our main power switch is. And you'll be able, again, if the system freezes, you just can uh, push this button down, give it about 10 seconds to totally turn off. And then you can uh, switch it back up to the sky and it'll do the uh, boot up process. Uh, I'll just make a note that the iPhone is for audio only. There is no uh, input into it for images. So it's just something to be aware of. And we do have adapters that are here at the, at the campus where you can, in, if you want your phone to be playing sound, it, just um, ask the supervisor and she'll be able to provide that adapter. The last troubleshooting I want to cover, which is our remote access one, where we find this is in our About button. So right up here at the very top, there's an I, the information screen. What we have is a remote access troubleshooter called iHelp. So if you select this, it's going to access a remote login session where our team will override the system and they'll try to help troubleshoot from uh, wherever the engineer is, is located. In addition to the iHelp, if you need something right away, we do have a 1-800 number, so right there, that 1-800-597-5911. You could easily call that and somebody is on support 24-7. So those are our two options for you know, quick remote access with the iHelp or you need phone support right there. In addition, if you reach out to the supervisor as well, they have local contact information for the Brain Lab personnel that can help uh, if you want to physically talk to that person. From here, the last thing I wanted to point out with this, uh, this buzz system is going to be screenshots. What the screenshots allow us to do is you can see that there's a camera under the monitor that we're on. So let's say the doctor requests a, a, a screenshot of what's happening on, say, the Philips 2 monitor. All you'll have to do is select the monitor in question, so I, and you'll see this arrow drops down with, in addition, the camera. And once you press the camera, the software takes a little snapshot, so again, I'll do it again so you can see that little flash. And at this point, the software has created this snapshot, which is a JPEG image, that we have the ability to export to an external media device. So to export that, again, I'll just dis display one more, I'll do one on the clock. So we'll, we'll jump it over to monitor seven. Monitor seven, we want to take a screenshot. I push the button, the camera flashes. I know the screenshot's been executed. Now I can go up to my export button at the very top, and what we'll see is there is this three screenshots that I just took. Now the data set is also gonna be selected. It's thinking that you may want to export the patient data with you. 
But if you deselect that data set, now I can export those three screenshots without having to carry that large data set and data set. So again, the idea here is I'll go back to this screen. If you want to export, we just click export and any of the screenshots that we have taken will be highlighted in orange. And our suggestion was if you don't want to bring you know, the patient data with you, you can leave it behind by deselecting it. And then from here, with these three highlighted, down at the bottom, I have this export option. Now, the export options, you have two options, a writable CD or a, a USB stick. So once a USB stick is inserted, you'll see that I'll have the ability to load up my patient scans. And it, it, again, our best bet here is, um, here it comes, it'll take a second to read my stick. And now you can see it's highlighted. And if I just touched that, it's now gonna export my patient data. And we should get a message saying export is successful once those three screenshots are sent to the stick. And there it is. Export completed. The operation has been completed successfully. There is no hard removal for this, so it's a plug and play. You can easily take this out. And then uh, if you want to print those screenshots, you'd have to take it to an external device printer. Uh, there's no printer associated with this. You can take it in the control room and they have a printer in there.